Yo, what's up guys, I'm Azure Soul, and welcome back to our follow-up video on my theories of Genshin Impact's 2.1 update, which just released the other day on the 1st of September. And we're gonna analyze and summarize 2.1's story in this video. And I'm gonna throw in some of my two cents along the way, just here and there. At the end of this video, I will be giving my overall impressions of the patch. So stay tuned for that, thank you. Before we get into the video, I'd like to say other than any trailers, all cutscenes and gameplay used in this video are my own recorded footage, and all music used in this video is from the user Mawar Volume. You can find all of his socials in the description below. Also, I will be putting timestamps on this video so that you can skip to any parts you're more interested in than others. Now, without further ado, let's get into it. So the first two things we left off with from our last video, the first two theories, well, the main two theories, was if Bart lose her nose, it's gonna be some bullshit because she's about that life and the first potential character death and we will be covering those uh throughout this analysis because obviously they come up so picking up from the last patch we end up sailing straight to watatsumi island and heading to the sanganomiya shrine which can i just say looks absolutely fucking gorgeous first of all like <laughs> oh my god it looked amazing in the trailer but bloody hell that was like Man, it's, it's beautiful. It was so beautiful in the game. Uh, but anyway, so the story takes place with uh, Kokomi. Uh, she appoints us as the captain of the Swordfish 2 squad. And we end up helping them out with some Ronin. We, you know, we, we pop them real quick. Now, all of this stuff with the Swordfish 2 squad happens over the course of a few days in game time. And what had happened in throughout this is we kept running into Tepe, who had mentioned a bunch of his exploits. Every time we seen him, he did something new, like something cool. And he got promoted in like an hour of game game time. <laughs> yeah, in about an hour of game time, which is ridiculous. Um, so Kokomi had also mentioned during while we were uh, doing this stuff with the swordfish that she had a mysterious backer who was helping out the Sanganomiya resistance with funds under one request that they kept trying to fight the Shogun's army and continue their resistance because they've been struggling with like weapons, armor, and supplies in general. So Kokomi decides to be stupid and take some mysterious backers money and do what they ask because you know you just want to be i get it you're desperate but like it's still stupid so uh what happens is later on uh during this little arc we see tepe a couple more times and every time we see him he just looks old he starts to look old man just looks so old it's ridiculous <laughs> and I was like, hold on, I remember in the trailer they were talking about accelerated aging. So when we continue the story, we find out from Goro that a lot of the soldiers had experienced accelerated aging. And it was because of some secret weapon. Um, and he confiscated one. And we obviously tell him, we say, oh, hold on, that's a delusion. And that drains people's life force. That's from the Fatui, the Fatui are the backers. So we quickly rush to Tepe's house because obviously that's our boy. And we confiscate his delusion, but he like loses his shit. He's like, yo, I need it, man. So I can follow in your footsteps. I just wanted to be like you. And it was, oh, I was sad. It was sad. I thought he was dying. Um, I really thought that this would be the first death because he looked like he was on death's door. His voice was so weak. He was, it was ridiculous. <laughs> so Tepe ended up closing his eyes and Aether gets super pissed. But thankfully, if you talk to his NPC after he closes his eyes, they actually just tell us that he passed out which allowed us to you know oh that's good he ain't dead okay because he didn't he definitely didn't deserve that he just he just wanted to he was stupid as well but he just wanted to shine you know what i'm saying so i have to get super pissed and kokomi mentions that the factory could be on some cliff on Yashiri island and afa just goes he rushes rushes straight to the island from there so we pull up to the factory, we bop some Fatui, and we eventually find proof that what they're doing is true. They're supplying the Sanganomiya resistance with delusions so they can, as for business, basically. And we find it out because there's some notes talking about second naval lieutenant Nathan in this dungeon. Uh, we fight a mini boss at the end, some water mir mirror maid, or whatever they're called again, the, the mirror maiden, mirror mage, whatever. And boom, after this battle, Scaramouche appears. He's made a return, he's finally come back since 1.1. Now, if you missed out on 1.1 Unreconciled Stars event, uh, which happened like last year, then you probably don't know who he is and you'll have a different cutscene play out. And you have some extra dialogue right at the beginning where he just introduces himself if you didn't play that event. But if you did play it, he just goes straight into the cutscene, the actual cutscene. Now, Scaramouche, he tells us all about how important this plan is and how it was hard to orchestrate 
and took a lot of work to get these delusions going in this little market where the Sanganamina resists. And he also tells us that he isn't the one behind all of it either. He's just uh, doing as, as he was told, he's just following orders. But he also starts to get a bit like cocky and he starts saying like human, human life is worthless ambitions and stuff like that there's no point and he just basically takes the piss out of Tepe he mocks Tepe Aether gets mad as hell and the whole room just fills with like this purple mist that takes a hold on Aether and suppresses him and he's like starting to pass out and Scaramouche claims it's because the room is filled with the wrath of the gods and it's feeding on his anger so as he's about to pass out we then see Yae Miko appear like we just get a small little glimpse of her now, after we wake up, we find out that Miko had saved us and that she's actually a bit of a playful character and a little bit of a troll. We just get a little bit of a glimpse into her personality, which is quite nice because this stays consistent throughout the whole 2.1 patch. And I can honestly say that I'd love her a lot more after playing the 2.1 patch. Um, so she even jokes about having Scaramouche on the floor begging for mercy, which is quite funny. But she then basically tells us not to worry about the factory and how she saved us because because she saved us we now owe her and we need to help her out so she had not to worry about it but she did let us know that kokomi and her troops had gone in and cleared out the factory full of delusions anyway which is really uh, which was really nice to know um so what she does then do is tell us that there are two riding shogans there is the one we faced in the boss battle and there's the one who tried to take thomas visions they're two different people the one we face in that special plane with all the tory gates that is A. That is the true Raiden Shogun. That is who she truly is. The one on the outside is a puppet that was created by her. Now, one thing we know about gods is that eventually they erode. Their soul erodes and their body erodes. So to escape this erosion, what A did is she wanted to reach eternity herself before acting on this eternity that she wanted to seek out. And she placed her consciousness inside of her sword and created the puppet known as the Raiden Shogun, Ba, which is the one on the outside. And that's pretty interesting. I thought that was pretty cool. So then what Miko does, though, is compare this to A acting that of a child, locking herself in her room and throwing a temper tantrum, <laughs> which I found quite funny. Um, but what Miko wants is she wants to save Inazuma and A if possible. So she puts us up to some special training to get ready to face the Shogun, and tells us because we're allowed to enter her plane of Euphemia that we're special. We've piqued her interest. That's why we're the only ones who can fight her. So she's got to put us through this training. A fun fact about this little cutscene, this little part of the story. If you haven't played the 1.1 event, Unreconciled Stars, and you never met Scaramouche, in Inazuma, he introduces himself as the Balladeer, not as Scaramouche. But when you wake up, Paimon still asks Yae about Scaramouche, she mentions his name, when Yae only refers to him as the Balladeer. So just a little bit of broken immersion there, just to pique your interest. So after we're done with our special training, uh, Sara, Kujo Sara, the Tengu, is invited to the shrine by Yae Miko. She tells her guards to go away and we have a private conversation and Yae Miko tells her that the Kujo clan and the Tenryo Commission have been lying to the Raiden Shogun in their reports about the Sangonomiya resistance. So what Sara does is she's like, you know, well, I don't believe you. I was adopted by the Kujo clan. I've seen their devotion to the Raiden Shogun for years. They would never do that. So Miko's like, all right, come back in three days. Come back in three days. Sara's like, bet, bet. But if you lying, I'm taking Aether with me. <laughs> I'm taking him with me. So within those three days, what we managed to do is Yai introduces us to Sayu from the Shumatsuban. Now, the Shumatsuban is a secret commission under Kamisato Ayato's control of the Ashiro Commission. And what happens is we meet up with her, and then we meet up straight after her, uh, after, after her with Ayaka and Toma back at the tea house. And Ayaka tells us about the Temuryo Commission's uh, potential bullshit. So we formulate a plan, and we borrow some massive fireworks from Yomiya. That what happens is we're going to go and set off the fireworks. While Sayu, the little ninja, she steals the documents proving the Temuryo Commission's crimes and the Fatui's involvement with them. So she steals them. Plan goes off without a hitch. We end up back at the shrine. It's three days later. Stara comes through. And Yaish gives her the documents. She is... She's distraught. She's distraught. She's outraged. She rushes back to Inazuma without a second fault. 
we follow after her. We end up at the Kujo clan's uh, house, uh, the little like headquarters or whatever you want to call it. And we find out that Kujo Takayuki took money from the Fatui as a reward and let them go around and like sort out the vision hunt decree and get that all orchestrated just so other clans couldn't topple them. Just so they could stay the head of the Tenryo Commission and stay the Tenryo Commissioner. That is like, it's, it's, it hits Sara hard because after we deal with him, it's like, she's just, you can tell she's just upset, man. She's like, damn, like, you guys raised me. I believed you. You know, I thought you guys were loyal to the Shogun. He only cared about her power. He was loyal to the Shogun's strength, not the Shogun. That's what we find out. So that was a bit upsetting on Sara's end. But after the fight, Sara claims that she was taught loyalty. And she, but she had doubted the decree in the past, thinking it was wrong, but chose to obey the Shogun regardless. But now that she knows the truth, she wants to go and tell the truth about what's up and what's happening. So we're coming up to the 2.1 finale now. So we enter Bar's chambers, we see Sara is on the floor, KO'd, and it was La Senora of all people that had popped her. La Senora of all people. And we weren't too surprised, we all saw the 2.1 trailer, we knew she'd be appearing at some point. Um, it turns out that she's the one that was behind everything uh, with the Vision Hunt decree. She was acting as a diplomat for Inazuma. Now, she starts talking mad trash. She's like, you're the most wanted man if you're playing Lumine slash wanted woman in all of Inazuma. Be careful what you do, what you say. We then get our first voice line in a while in terms of story, and we challenge her to a duel before the throne. Now, we do this so that the Shogun can't just outright arrest us and potentially honors the request, and she does. So we fight Senora, but we pop her in her booty, man. Like, we pop her in her booty so hard. And we find out before the fight starts, it, like, well, midway through the fight, it brings up her title. She is uh, Rosalind Krushka Lohefolta. Uh, she is the, let me please let me know if I botched that name. She is the Crimson Bush of the Flames, which the same named artifact set, Lord, I guess that set is based on her. Um, the ice element was only a delusion. That wasn't her real power. Her real power was the fire that she uses. Um, but we beat her. After we beat her, Baal straight up just eviscerates her from existence with the Muso no Hito Tachi. Now, I didn't notice at the time because I was so surprised by this plot twist. But after watching back on my footage, I tell you this now. Yeah, you can notice it too. You probably notice it in the video because you can pause it or slow it down or whatever. Her body actually disintegrates to ash after she gets hit by it. I didn't notice at the time because I was just so shocked. Like, I did predict a character death. I didn't think she'd be the first one. That, that was absolutely insane. That was amazing. That was a great plot twist. And I didn't even think a Harbinger would die. That's mainly why I was shocked. I didn't think a Harbinger would die this point in the game, at least. This, uh, I, I sort of feel like it's a bit too early for Harbingers to get popped. But oh, she got popped. So it, that happened. And after that happens, uh, the Shogun, aka Baal, so this is an A, this is Baal the puppet. She mentions that even though we're still a threat to eternity, she's going to uphold the rules that I was the victor of the duel and let us go. Now, as we walk out of that castle, let me tell you now, that was one of the best moments. The sheer pressure of what had just happened. The presence of Baal's power. You get the thunderstorm coming down. The whole screen is shaking. It's red. Aether is like, he is shook. Aether is shook as hell. And he's just slowly walking. Man, he's not got the will to like fight no more, man. It, man, it was crazy. Like it, it was a crazy little conclusion to that battle. And we're walking, we're walking, we're walking, we're walking. Because Mahalia has now shown us that they're about that life. They're about that life. So we're walking, we're walking. All of a sudden, the Sanganamiya resistance appears as we exit the castle. And it's back up. It's like, what back up? Like, we're done with the fight. The Shogun is like, psych! Like she straight up, just straight up, just appears out of nowhere trying to sucker punch us from behind. And she was massive, was mad. She came in like some Titan. In this moment, Kazuha remembered his deceased friend's words, which are, there will always be those who dare to brave the lightning's glow. Boom, his friend's vision activates. Kazuha zooms in, deflects the attack. They gets knocked back by the second hit. Then we found our will to fight again. We make some mini Excalibur, this little mini like Saber Excalibur, this purple one. And we go after and then boom, we end up in the plane of Euthymia. And this was crazy. This is a crazy moment in the show because it has now shown us it is possible for someone to wield two visions. Kazuha is officially the first temporary 
dual vision wielder because it immediately lost its power after he was used he was specifically using wind and lightning at the same time during that clash and he lost his powers after the, uh well he lost the lightning power after so we don't know whether anyone will ever be able to dual wield visions ever again um it was temporary he did it for about five seconds and then it was gone so it's pretty interesting if that'll ever happen again in the long run so within the plane of euphemia we tell the shogun about the vatui and that she's not paying attention outside she stated that she would have been popped the fatui if they hindered her eternity a long time ago she acknowledged the vision hunt decree she wanted that happen so we then argue with her and um, we tell her that we're going to shake her will but instead of shaking we're not just going to shake we're going to like completely destroy it and we get into a crazy fight with her again just like in 2.0 now, mid-fight, she seals our elemental skill and ult again. And what happens is, mid-fight, we get to a cutscene. And we pull out the charm that was given to us by Yai and Miko. And then she appears. <laughs> Miko appears. And he's like, oh, so you were behind all this. And she's like, well, don't forget who taught you how to place your consciousness into objects. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> and she asks us about her ambition. Is it enough to shake her will? Don't forget that we're not alone. There's other people fighting beside us, and we basically get fueled by everyone's ambitions outside, just outside the plane. They're, they're fighting the current bar. We get fueled by that shit. And it resonates with us, and we turn into a whole Super Saiyan. We turn into a whole ass Super Saiyan, <laughs> which is pretty cool. And um, so we jump right back into the fray. Right back into the fray uh, in our Super Saiyan form, and we got all our skills back, and we beat her. And then Miko tells her, you know, just take the L, man. Take the L, just take fucking L, man. <laughs> and um, Yai and A, and us as well, we put in our two cents. We go back and forth about what eternity is, mainly about ambitions that they cannot easily be snuffed out. Um, Yai tells a really cool quote, and so are we to just abandon the notion of progress for the sake of wishful thinking? A immediately responds, you and I have witnessed the great loss that progress can bring. This then leads into a little mini cool little cutscene. And A mentions that uh, someone's last words were, never stop searching, even if only for a brief flash of light, if nothing else, we have the present moment. Now, she mentions she's seen a nation stride forward and lose everything to heavenly principles. When she's saying this, we see Kamria. Kamria got popped. And we also see her holding someone looks like her in her arms it's dead <laughs> now that left a lot of like i was like hold on is that the thing i said about maybe being her mother or something but basically uh a mentions that eternity is a promise she made to people and then yaya says but the people need her divine gaze not her promises and she's like oh the vision she's like yes they need divisions um and then a says that people couldn't afford to bear any extra losses and then yaya tells her you know eternity is too cruel a fate for you you know one thing you've stopped doing is not just paying attention to the world you've stopped paying attention to yourself you know you've been lonely for centuries just look at this the minute i entered this area your euphemia the color changed the sky went from dark to light because you're happy to see me and then a is like oh this is a childish conversation you're oversimplifying things and it's really interesting this plane of euphemia first of all because if you guys have noticed there's a shit ton of tory gates all over the place which tory gates if you don't know represent the borderline between the spirit plane and the mortal plane so it's quite interesting i like that what that represents with her you know crossing uh placing her consciousness in this sword this has allowed her to you know transcend the mortal plane but obviously she hasn't she's just running away from everything and Miko basically tells her, you know, nothing's going to change by just standing still, remaining in stasis forever. You're refusing progress and just building up loneliness, basically. Um, and then A, like I said earlier, I said A comments as childish. But in the end, A admits that seeing Miko was a nice surprise to eternity. And she ends up agreeing and abol uh, abolishing the Vision Hunt decree. Uh, Kazuha returns his vision to his friend's grave. And everything seems to sort of go back to normal, right? So at the end of 2.1, Miko gives us a big information dump. And you can ignore the questions, but if you ask him, well, you get a lot of um, lore. Now, if you guys remember back in 1.1, Zhongli himself had mentioned that Baal was deceased and there was a new Electro Archon that had taken up the mantle. So what we find out from Miko 
Now remember the cutscene we just saw with Baal about her backstory, and if you remember her trailer too, she was chasing after someone who looked like her and she was crying. There was originally two twin gods for Inazuma, Baal and Beelzebul. Baal being Makoto and Beelzebul being A. Now they had won the Archon War together and Baal established the Shogunate while Beelzebul became her body double basically and they ruled Inazuma jointly and not everyone was none the wiser because they were twins, they looked alike. No one needed to know that there was two of them. But what happened was Makoto died in a war several hundred years ago, AKA Onria, as we saw in the cutscene. Now Makoto was like the icing on the cake. Now remember, she already lost her three friends back in the day, as we saw from the trailer. She lost her three friends and now she lost her sister. So after that, that's when A was just like, yeah, no, nah, I'm done. I'm done. And she had uh, given up her gnosis to Miko. And that's when she chose to seek eternity from, this, uh, from the looks of it. Now, what we did find out about her gnosis, now this, mm, this is annoying. She did lose it in the end. She lost the gnosis in the end. But we're going to get to that in a second. We're gonna get, just give me a second. So one uh, cool personality straight to keep from the character Makoto, aka the original Baal, is the quote that her sister said um, earlier about, you know, never stop searching, even if only for a brief flash of light, if nothing else, we have the present moment. Now, because we, we asked Miko what she was like, and Miko said she didn't spend too much time with her. But the impression she got was that she was a gentle god who cherished the beauty of what she had in the moment, which is pretty cool. So she was someone who like didn't really look too much in the future. She went to the past, she just liked to enjoy what she had in the moment and just focus on that. So that was completely different than A's current goals. Now, what, uh, we didn't ask her about our sister, but she said she doesn't know nothing about the gods and A is definitely not the god. And like, yeah, we know that because we just fought her. Um, but she is going to use her resources. She's going to get borrow Ayato and the Shumatsu bun to help find out some more about our sister. And now we're going to get back to the Gnosis. Sorry about that. So it's going to lead into this. So check this out. Scaramouche, right? You remember him? We spoke about him a little while ago in this video. <laughs> Scaramouche was the first prototype puppet built by A when she was building a puppet to, so she could leave her body and put her conscience into her sword. The first puppet prototype was Scaramouche. He was built with the technology, as I mentioned earlier, lost the time that only A knows about. And what happened was she was going to discard him. Like originally she was going to discard him, right? But it was, she must have thought that was too cruel of fate. So then instead of discarding him, she just sealed his power. And he ended up wandering in Azuma as just a normal guy with his own consciousness. Then the Fatui, of course, took an interest in him and unsealed his power, as well as possibly making him even stronger than he should have been, his original prototype version. Now back to the Gnosis. <laughs> so Miko mentioned that because he's number six and Senora's number eight, he's much stronger than her. And then obviously, that obviously now, because we know all this, we know he's strong because he's got sealed power that Baal had sealed in uh, A, sorry, had sealed inside of him. And that she didn't want to fight him. She didn't want to risk it. So she gave him A's Gnosis because when A went to seek eternity, like I said earlier, she gave Miko her Gnosis because she'd severed ties with Celestia. So she still lost her Gnosis in the end, guys. Which is, oh, it's annoying. Like, yeah, she didn't lose it because she was weak, at least. But the fact that she still lost it, it's like this, it is, is this how it's going to be? Every arc, they're just going to lose their gnosis. And is the game's story really not going to seriously start until Shneznaya? We don't know. All we know about the Shneznayans is the one quote that Rosalind said. She said something about uh, the Sarita's dream being the most purest and noblest noblest of all and that's all we have that's all we have to go on from that so that was annoying but we did get a little bit of information on 3.0 slash sumeru which will be the next region we go to uh, which will be the god of dendro now it was mentioned in the cutscene that their deity is the lesser lord kusanali and that she's a female now that's interesting because gone you had mentioned a very very long time ago that it was a dude it was a he 
But if you go back into the archives and go back and play replay the voice line, the cuts they change it to she at some point. Um, which is, I was like, okay, I don't know why they made that decision, but it's interesting to find out. I do hope they haven't completely abandoned the design of the Dendro Archon by making him a female. I hope they've made like a, there's going to be a, another male Dendro character who still has that design because we know all the Archons look amazing. So it'd be really cool if they kept the design at least. But yeah, it seems the region of Sumer are really obsessed with knowledge and we know this, we've met a bunch of their scholars throughout the game and side quests and a uh, little bit of side story stuff already. So it'll be pretty interesting to see what's going on with that region. Especially because they apparently like stockpile knowledge as a resource as well. So it's like, that's interesting. That's an interesting region that will definitely be cool to go to whenever it decides to launch we don't know when that's coming obviously but right now we got just wait for 2.2 on the way i guess now we're gonna move a bit past 2.1 before i get to my overall impressions and we're gonna also talk about a's quest a story quest the ride in shogun story quest now the whole summary of this quest how it starts is everyone's panicking because the thunderstorm that's normally brewing around uh i think it's normally brewing around seirai island is like moving closer apparently um, and it's because, well, Miko guesses it's because the temperament has changed of uh, A's mood. So she gives us a pass, which allows us to see her. And we go talk to her. We go talk to A in her little plane of Euphemia. And we find out that the puppet, the Raiden Shogun, is just sort of malfunctioning because she's trying to modify her initial rule of, you know, seeking eternity. And she's got an official safeguard so when she built the puppet she put in a safeguard against modification because she knew eventually well, was not new but she predicted that she might change her mind one day so she's like built in a safeguard so she's trying to deal with that and it's quite funny how she defended it because we're like yo everyone's like panicking and she's like well i've never had to tinker with the shogun before you know something is bound to go wrong she's like i'm not making excuses which was <laughs> it was nice to see a little uh, cute side to her and then we saw so what we do, we take her out into town to help her relax and just let her see the modern Inazuma. And this was really cool because we got to see an even more of a cute side to A. We found out that she loves sweet things. She loves desserts. Uh, she can't cook or do much. For, she doesn't really do much because if anything she needs, he gets the commission to bring it to her. Um, but she really loved the Dango milk from the early on in her quest. She really loved that milk. That was quite funny. Uh, she loves to read light novels. But when she tried reading the modern day light novels, she was a bit confused. She's like, I know all the words, but you know, putting them together, they just don't make sense. We were helping her out with that, which was, that was quite funny. Because if you watch a lot of anime, if you're a weeb like me, they actually poked fun at isekai titles in the light novel part of that story quest. <laughs> it's quite funny actually, because the, the titles for a lot of these isekai anime do be kind of stupid and like all similar as, as hell. So it's quite funny. Um, and then we end up taking a picture of her. We take a picture of her and we show her the, on the camera with a K. And it's quite interesting because she ends up realizing that she's wary of any and all change, but she doesn't wish for the pursuit of eternity to stop human lives from changing for the better. So it seems we really opened her eyes while we was out here showing her the current modern day Inazuma. It's really nice to see. She's like, okay, I get it. Like, like eternity, I still want eternity, but it can take a different form. It's really nice to see that. So, now one of the other things she said was, um, where is it? Uh, she stated that she'll remember the trip for a long time and it's made her think a lot. And one of her quotes was, so even I who seeks eternity and constantly changing my form of existence. Now she specifically said this quote when we showed her her picture on the camera and Paimon has suggested that this version of you on the camera was just another form of your existence. Just think of it like that, like with Bao, there's many versions of you or, or existences of you. And it was quite, it, for Paimon of all things to say that, you know, <laughs> it was quite uh, interesting. It was, it was quite an interesting quest line. Then it picked up a bit because Ipe, who works for Kujo, uh, what's his name? Kujo Kamaji came and told us that, yo, he went to go speak with the Takatsukasa clan it's, uh, but we don't know where he's gone. He's gone missing since. So the Shogun's like, well, this is all happening because, you know, me neglecting. So I'm going to take part. We're going to find Kujo Kamaji and see what's going on. So we find out that they were meeting in some secluded area. And Takatsukasa Susumu, who is the current head of the Takatsukasa clan, is trying to become the next Tenryo commissioner. He's trying to force K Kujo Kamaji to sign a confession and paint his clan in a good light and all that all that bad stuff 
So A is like, well, hold on, this is perfect because guess how I choose the new Tenryo Commissioner? Uh, you're gonna fight me in a duel, mate. If you can beat me, you can be the Tenryo Commissioner because that's how the first one became it. He demonstrated his will with his blade in hand. And then Susumu was like, well, uh, you know, I don't really, I don't really want smoke. And she was like, oh, you don't want smoke? I right, then. <laughs> they shut up. <laughs> and it was pretty cool. Because then what had happened was uh, Kamaji, Kamaji stepped forth and he shows his maturity here and he challenges her, knowing full well that it won't help atone the sins of his clan. He knows this, he knows this, but he's accepting the punishment on behalf of his clan and their wrongdoings. And he basically went into the fight wanting to die, which is kind of a little bit sad because like he didn't deserve that. But one of the things he said was, you know, you can't even fail at stopping your clan if you didn't even try, basically. And I was like, oh damn, like he's really like that hard up on himself. So A fights him and she realizes after the fight, she's like, you know what? The Kujo honor still courses through his veins. And she decides not to kill him. But it was crazy. She mentioned that if that was the puppet that had fought in Bar, she would have just slain him right there. She wouldn't even care. <laughs> and she was still in her current function. So that was crazy. That was really good that A was the one who fought him. That was a really cool uh, conclusion to the to the story quest because then what happened in the end was um, she said like, you know, eventually I'm going to change the commissioner. But for now, because of his honor, I'll let him stay in there and basically, you know, try and uh, reconcile some of the mistakes that the clan has made. And a quote that she said from the fight was, he has shown me how some things remain the same even as the world around them changes. And she tells us that the things we did today helped her come to this realization. As you know, we kind of guessed earlier from all the stuff she was saying. And she apologizes for some of the mistakes she's made. And she basically says, I'm gonna go meditate for a little bit longer and stay isolated just a little bit longer. Now they all know I'm chill. So yeah. And it was, it was really cool, like 2.1. Oh man, 2.1 was really cool. So, here's, so my overall impressions, just yes, like yes. MiHoYo hit the mark so well with this patch. They completely blew away my expectations and just went like ham on this arc for real with the writing. Uh, unfortunate about the Gnosis part, for fuck's sake, but you know, it's whatever. Um, overall, coming off of the 2.0 hype, it was very well done. Uh, 2.0 was a little bit slow at the beginning, but definitely picked up nicely later on. And with the added 2.1 story, it did very well at keeping my interest in the whole Inazuma story arc. It kept my interest the whole time for 2.1. So that was really good. Uh, as for the exploration, the game is in a very good state for me. It feels like when I first started playing Genshin all over again since 2.0, like with the gameplay, there's a lot of content, especially since I'm the type of player who does not rush these kind of games and I juggle other games at the same time. I have a lot to do, so it's been a lot of fun, honestly. Um, minus the tree farming, hate tree farming. I love customizing myself in the teapot, but I hate tree farming. And I've never been a fan of fishing in any fucking video game ever. Like, I've never been a fan of fishing in video games. So I really don't like the fishing aspect, especially because I know there'll eventually be an event and they'll force us to fish for an event or something. But personally, I just find fishing boring and the tree farming boring. But other than that, there's a lot to do. Uh, there's been a lot of new dope designed enemies, some cool mini story art quests, for example, like, you know, Orobashi's Legacy, the Sacred Sakura Cleansing Ritual, um, the Seirai Island Storm that we had to clear, and the Mikage Furnace. Like, there's been a cool bunch of, like, lore and just side stuff that, like, it's just been such a fun region and a fun playthrough so far. And it was just all really nice, and I still have a lot more to do. So, yeah, overall, 2.1, a pretty solid patch, I would say. A pretty solid patch, in my opinion. But what are your opinions? What are your thoughts? Please comment down below. I'd love to hear what you guys have to say, the things you did like, the things you didn't like about 2.1. And thank you to anybody who made it this far into the video. I'm going to be signing out now. Have a good one all, and thank you again. Stay tuned for next time.